I happen to be holding a book here. As an author, I like to see books held up to the television audience, of course, but this is a special one, very special. I just had a little while to look at it, but it's an eyewitness account of Apollo by astronaut, explorer, artist, moonwalker, Alan Bean. Indeed, Alan Bean is all of those things. He was the fourth man to walk on the moon. He was the commander of the second Skylab mission. He is an artist, an explorer, it says here, moonwalker, all those things, and he's with us. That's <laughs> the most Walter. important thing, you're with us. <laughs> Glad to be here. Good today. to have you here. It's good to have you. Alan, tell me something. Day. These guys are out there now, and the ladies out there now, they're suited up, they're getting suited up, had breakfast. Are there, are there butterflies, despite the coolness of the test pilot attitude, are there butterflies at this moment? Well, I think there are a few, but fortunately, NASA has you suit up and go do this a couple of times, so it has a feeling of unreality that, oh, maybe this is like uh, the training. Maybe we're really not going today. So it helps solve some of these butterflies. It's only in the last maybe 15 or 30 minutes that you begin to say, everything's working, we're going today. Alan Bean, of course, uh, Apollo 12, your mission, uh, was launched in the presence of President Nixon, and it was launched right into a thunderstorm. And a lot of historians have looked back on that and said those NASA controllers felt a little bit of pressure. We could make an analogy to today. The president is here. Will the people in the launch control over there, be a control center, be under uh, enormous pressure to launch this thing no matter what? I don't think so. They're aware he's there. But uh, particularly after Challenger, I don't think anybody in this business is going to respond to pressure. Uh, no, no, we've learned our lesson. No, we've learned our lesson. Maybe in the past, I don't know. But John Glenn is uh, not only living the dream, that was mentioned earlier, for him. I think he's living the dream for so many people in the world, particularly someone like me that's 66. Yeah. And just to see him go up and see, when he comes back, we're going to love it so much, we're going to yeah. say, hey, I can start a new career. I'm only <laughs> 70. You'll have to get your pilot out and do another picture of another hero. Oh, that's a right. Hero, yeah. That's right. But he's going up there for all of us. It's different than most astronauts. I you know, I wondered why uh, Nixon came to see the second uh, Apollo mission. Was it because of Alan Bean uh, being aboard, do you think? Or? <laughs> I, I, I don't doubt that a bit. <laughs> I don't tell Pete Conrad and Dick my, Gordon. My, my theory <laughs> was that uh, Nixon was so careful of his image, he decided to see if the first mission got to the moon all right. Ah, there you and go. then he'd come and watch the second. <laughs> More of a sure thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, presidents I, uh, preserve their image in some ways. I, I don't know if you saw earlier, but uh, our correspondent Mark Potter in Titusville found Dick Gordon in the crowd there, watching from uh, the crowds there among the Winnebago's. Oh, uh, really? There, yeah. There's more astronauts down here than I've seen at the Space Center since Apollo 11. The excitement. We're all older too, you know. <laughs> He's going up there for us. So it's really a lot of excitement. I hope that NASA doesn't just say, well, we did it one time, forget it. My hope is that they maybe send Tom Hanks in six months. Or they approach you, Walter, you would be a perfect person to go into space and observe and come back and tell us things that test pilots like myself I, can't tell. I we find, don't know. I find it very disappointed that NASA, through all the years since Challenger, has not come around to restoring the civilian and space program, particularly getting a journalist up there. Should have an artist up there. Should have a poet up there. Yes. These people should interpret for us what space is like uh, to the non-trained astronaut. But you can understand the reluctance uh, post-challenger, Krista McAuliffe, of course, the first well, teacher in space. Uh, I can't understand the reluctance because exploration is all about risk, and the people that are going to do it are willing to accept the risk sure. and say it's worth. Uh, Nobody's being drafted to go. Absolutely not, and uh, we need to make make people understand that, you know, the future of space flight is not just for healthy young men and women in the prime of life. The future of space flight 50, 100, 150 years from now is for everybody. It's, we, we need to begin to get that thought through. Now that, that, that's where there is genuine science involved in this flight, despite what critics say about yes. it. That, that we have to begin to establish what the parameters are for those who go into space. And one of the important parameters will be, as the generations get older and older, is how old you can be and go up there and function uh, properly. Absolutely. As, as well as the benefits on Earth of finding out the similarities between space flight and aging on Earth. That's going to be helpful to all of us. Let, but, let me just uh, break in stuff. for a moment. We're going to show a picture here. This is the final inspection team, which is on the gantry leading over to the shuttle. Final inspection team performs an important job. They go in and make sure that, uh, first of all, that the um, 
cryogenic fuel. That's a fancy word, way of saying that it's very explosive and also is very cold. Uh, has not created too much of an ice glaze over the external tank. That ice glaze upon launch that can break off and can cause some difficulties for the protective heat insulating tiles on the space shuttle, thousands of them covering the space shuttle. They're on there now, and I'm thinking, Alan Bean, a lot of reliance upon the ground crew, a lot of trust must be instilled upon them. I know astronauts feel a real bond, don't they? We do. If people don't do their jobs, you're in trouble, and you have to count on individuals caring a lot. I think that's why our space program has been as successful as it has been. People care. You talk with them. When I see people that retired from the program after Apollo, that was the highlight of their career. I know, as you've said several times, reporting the space activities is one of the great highlights of your career. People care about this. All thing. right, let me about dive in one more time. There's Commander Kurt Brown in his <laughs> launch and reentry uh, suit. He's giving you a little uh, idea of what the ascent is going to be all about, hopefully at 2 p.m. Eastern today. Kurt Brown told his mother he was on this flight. She's normally ho-hum. She said, you're going with Senator Glenn, really? <laughs> Pilot Steve Lindsay, he'll be sitting in the right-hand seat on the ride uphill, as astronauts like to call it. He thinks that Glenn's flight is the first step toward bringing civilians, tourists even, into yeah. space. Ellen Bean, I know you'd second that one, wouldn't you? I definitely would. I, I think it's time. You know, NASA does a wonderful job, but we do 100% science technology. We need to start thinking maybe 98% science and technology and 2% right. public interest. This is the man, uh, Pedro Duque, the first Spaniard to uh, go into space, hopefully at 2 p.m. Eastern today. The man they call Juan Glenn. Juan <laughs> Glenn, he is a national hero. And uh, he's been waiting six years to fly. Long time to wait. Uh, he is the space rookie on board this particular mission of Discovery. These suits have come a long way, haven't they, Walter? Uh, uh, these things uh, combined with all the gear weigh 83 pounds. Yeah. Uh, they have liquid-cooled underwear, and it's a long way from those silver Mercury suits. There's, There's Stephen Robinson, by the way. A lot more mobility in these suits than there used to be in the old suits, obviously. That, uh, yes. You can hardly bend your arms. In those well, old that's suits. right. Now, they don't have to go EVA in these suits, as you know. They're just for survival in the event of a problem. Now. Steve I Robinson, have... by the way, I just want to say, tell you, Steve Robinson is looking forward to greeting John Glenn to space because the first time John Glenn was there, he was all alone. And there's Scott Parazinski, who has a resume that, uh, well, it's like a telephone book. The guy has been everywhere, done just about everything, among his many titles. He is a medical doctor and uh, mission specialist and the flight engineer, who is the person who sits behind the, the uh, commander and the pilot checking all the instruments and gauges. We had you a know, chance to... You know, one of the criticisms leveled against the flight, there are always naysayers, of course, of any of these things, and, and you got to pay attention to the, the downside as well, but there's been mentioned, there's another medical doctor going up today. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea that there are two medical doctors going, uh, some people see as protection for John Glenn. This crew was selected long before John Glenn was added to it, uh, uh, and uh, it has nothing to do with the fact he's going to be up there. No, Point worth noting, yeah. No, the, the, and there he is, John Glenn. There he is. Looking, he's smiling, he's beaming, as I guess we'd suspect. Uh, Walter, you've known him for years. What's he thinking now, do you think? What's he thinking about? Yeah. Well, I think he's thinking about the very thing he said he'd be thinking about. He doesn't want to mess up. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be... He's a perfectionist. John always has been. He was sometimes thought as the Boy Scout of the uh, original seven astronauts. Uh, and uh, he, he, I'm sure, is intent uh, right now on all of the things he's been learning, grilling with the last several months, and being sure that nothing, uh, that he doesn't do anything wrong. And, uh, you know, he kind of looks like the Michelin Man there. We should explain to folks at home what they do is basically inflate these suits to make sure there's no leaks. And uh, when they inflate, you kind of feel like a Michelin man, right, Alan Bean? You do, and the helmet pops up. You noticed it for a while. We could only see his nose, and now it's deflated. But he's ready to go. That's what he's thinking about, too. He's thinking, I hope this all checks out. Uh, we don't want to change the suit here at the last minute. He's, uh, he's ready. He's, uh, he's smiling. John's probably also thinking about those ten times that his Mercury 7 was getting ready to go and didn't get to go. Oh, yes. It was the 11th attempt before he ever got off the ground. Four times he was suited up. Twice he was at the top of the, the, the pad, uh, ready to go, and the uh, mission was canceled. I, he undoubtedly is thinking about that today. You yes. know, he said he never got frustrated or angry during that. He just uh, sort of took it a day at a time, an hour at a time. Alan, uh, is, that, is that the best way to approach a mission like this? You have to just sort of think about the immediate 
future? I'm not sure what John Glenn was saying to himself about that. What he said to us in the press was it just gives us a little more time for a little more experience. Yeah. That's right. He has great self-discipline. Uh, as you said, it has a Boy Scout image, which is good to have. Yeah, particularly in this profession. <laughs> so I think he's just happy to be there, and he he knows he's living the dream for all of us. He, he, he's he got a lot of responsibility to come up there and say things that we can't say, that we don't have the insight. That's one of the great reasons to have him go instead of someone else. That's right. That, that's the whole idea of the civilian in space. In a sense today, what we're taking is, is, uh, is a hero back to space, but we're also taking a man who spent 24 years in the United States Senate, for heaven's yes. sakes, has a, a feeling for the pulse of the American public. He knows what is needed to tell them about space flight, and uh, therefore should be an exceedingly valuable spokesman. He has been all along, that his, uh, his validity will be reasserted today by this next flight.